Hey, welcome back to another episode of Return of the King, where we are going chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation, trying to understand the end of the age and what the Bible really has to say that. In this study, we've been trying to get past speculation and systems and really just stick to what scripture really has to say about it. So I'm glad you're here today and hope that you'll uh, join us in the, the conversation as we go along here. Today, we're looking at that exciting topic and really often puzzling it's been a much debated uh, and discussed topic of who are the 144,000. Uh, maybe you're like me and you were reading through the, uh, the book of Revelation initially and you come to Revelation chapter 7 and you're trying to figure out who are these 144,000 that are being talked about? That's been a question that's been around for a long time and probably will be until the very end. But we're going to try to do our best to answer that question from Scripture, using Scripture, uh, to really uh, get a grasp on who the 144,000 are, because this is a significant point in the book of Revelation. So let's uh, dive in. Uh, but as we're getting started, I'm kind of curious, uh, who do you think the 144,000 are right now? So even if you've never commented on a YouTube video before, would you mind just leaving a comment and letting me know uh, right here at the beginning and just kind of mark it beginning and who I think they are? And if you don't know, go ahead and just leave a, I have no idea. Uh, you're, you're, you're in really good company, so it's okay to leave that. And I'd just be excited to see uh, where people are when they're coming in. And then at the very end of this, I'm going to ask you again, uh, who do you think the 144,000 are? Maybe through this, uh, you'll come to the same kind of conclusion I will. Uh, maybe you'll uh, just come away with, well, I don't agree, but you've given me some things to think about. I just really look forward to hearing from you. This will be really helpful for me. And uh, I just appreciate you taking the time to watch today. So let's jump in, jump in as we take kind of a deep dive here into Revelation chapter 7. So starting in verse 1, you can follow along in your translation uh, if you like. I'm using the English Standard Version, ESV, uh, for this study here. So starting in verse 1 of Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel descending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So let's uh, unpack this part a little bit, kind of get this uh, the stage set. Uh, we are interrupted. We've been in the middle of the study of the first six seals uh, in the book of Revelation. And then between the six and seven, here, here, here is this interruption where John sees this other vision of four angels who are holding back uh, the four winds. Um, and this really points to imminent judgment. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 36. There's a similar kind of scene uh, where God is about to bring judgment. And he says, and I will bring judgment upon Elam, the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and I will scatter them to all the winds, and there shall be no nation to which those driven out of Elam shall not come. So this mention of the four winds uh, we see as, as imminent judgment about to, uh, to happen. And what we know is that with the seventh seal, part of that is that the seven trumpets are given to angels, or, or trumpets are given to seven angels. And this is where we see judgments about to come. But before this happens, uh, we see that there's this imminent judgment, and there is a delay in that. Now, in saying the four corners of the earth obviously does not mean that the earth is flat or square. Uh, please don't leave me any comments about that. <laughs> And secondly, it doesn't mean that there was no breeze on the earth. Again, this is pointing to the, the coming judgment of God and that, that pause in that moment. The winds are representing the judgment that's about to come. Uh, and so really the main point of this whole scene is that judgment is being delayed until the servants are sealed. So it's this pause uh, for uh, the servants of God to be healed. And we see this uh, here in this verse, do not, verse three, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the, those servants of God. So interestingly, there's no further mention of the four angels or the four winds. Uh, we're, we, we're left to assume that the four angels are holding back the four winds, uh, and then once the, the 144,000 are sealed, then they are free to release the winds of judgment, which is the, the, the seven trumpets that are about to blow. 
interesting play on words there. Hadn't really thought of that. Um, and so the uh, again, it seems to be the pointing to the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath. And and part of the reason why I say, I say that is because in chapter seven, verse three, there are three things that are specifically mentioned not to be harmed: earth, sea, and trees. Interestingly, when you get to the uh, blowing of the trumpets, uh, you see that with the first trumpet, it affects the earth. And so let me go back. So remember, it's earth, sea, and trees that are not to be harmed. Uh, with the first trumpet, it's going to affect the earth. So the first angel blows his trumpet, uh, followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees. Here's another one of those elements that was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And then the second uh, trumpet is going to affect the sea. So the second uh, angel blows his trumpet, and a third of the sea became blood. Uh, so I, I think that, again, these four angels are withholding that judgment until the sealing of the 140. 4,000. This is a significant event. Judgment is not allowed to come until this event happens that the, the angel seals the 144,000. So what is the seal that's being talked about? Well, I think we can get a clue from Ezekiel chapter 9. This is another moment where we see judgment about to come, uh, that there have been, there's been that wickedness uh, in uh, Jerusalem uh, and throughout all of Israel. And this is that Babylonian uh, captivity time frame. And God is bringing this in. Uh, so we have both righteous and unrighteous people that are living in the city. Uh, and so God is about to make a distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous in Jerusalem. And again, this is in uh, Ezekiel chapter 9. Uh, so this is around 590-ish uh, BC, give or take a little bit. And it says um, in uh, chapter 9, verse 4 of Ezekiel, And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others, he said in my hearing, pass through the city after him and strike. Your eye shall not spare and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. And began at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. And then he said to them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck the city. So here, again, back in um, verse 4, these angels are told to go and put a mark on the righteous. Those that are seeing the evil, the abomination that's going on, the idolatry, even within the temple. And these are the ones who are groaning over that. They are, they're deeply distressed. So their righteous hearts wants to see righteous worship of God, service to God, purity in that worship. And so they're seeing this, and this is that distinguishing mark between those who are loyal to God and those who have fallen into idolatry, uh, those who are rebelling against God. And so they're told that anyone who doesn't have the mark, just go and kill outright. Doesn't matter if they're young or old, um, uh, women or children, that if they are um, uh, have, have not been loyal to God, they're rebelling against him, that they are to be, be killed without mercy. So here's that distinction. It says uh, the angel is told to pass through the city and put a mark. Literally, the word in Hebrew is to put a tav. A tav is the Hebrew letter, uh, the, the last Hebrew letter in the alphabet, and it's, you know, just simply means a mark. Um, and, and that's interesting. And so that the, he's supposed to put a tav on the foreheads of men. Now, if you were to look at a Hebrew Old Testament today, this is what a tav would look like. Toward the end of that Babylonian captivity, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, began to use the Aramaic uh, letters uh, for their writings. And so they abandoned the old Paleo-Hebrew script, which was more uh, pictograms, kind of like hieroglyphs, not exactly like that, but they were, it was more pictorial. So there was a significant change that happened in their writing uh, between the beginning of the Babylonian captivity and the end. And, and that's pretty um, amazing when you think about what a Paleo Hebrew uh, Tav would have looked at like this is probably what the alphabet would have still looked like whenever uh, this angel was told to go put a mark when he was told to put a Tav on them. This is what a Tav looked like. Now, I don't know if there's a direct significance to this, but it does make me really scratch my head and wonder. Um, and, and it may indeed. And, and again, this is kind of delving into some speculative stuff. Could this indeed be what we sort of see as the ceiling of the 144,000 uh, in Revelation chapter 7? So kind of a cool side thought there. 
Um, and and uh, again, when we're talking about marks, there are two distinct marks in the book of Revelation. So the first one, the primary one is the seal of God. Uh, and this is what we're seeing in Revelation chapter seven, uh, the counterfeit that the Antichrist, the, that unholy Trinity brings about is trying to replicate the original mark, and it is the mark of the beast. Uh, so this is a, a different mark. This is the one that most people tend to get more obsessed about, be more aware about uh, of than the other. But the more important one here is really the seal of God. And seal means ownership. Who is it that the person belongs to? Um, and and uh, you see in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, uh, it says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and the, with him the 144,000. The other mention of the 144,000 in the book of Revelation is in Revelation chapter 14. But notice how they're described. They're described as who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So this seems to be that mark of ownership, that those who have the seal of God in Revelation 7 uh, are the ones who belong truly to God. These are the loyal ones, just like in Jerusalem in Ezekiel's day, this is that distinguishing mark between those that truly belong to God and those that don't. Because sometimes people will be religious and they may put on a good game, but God knows the heart. He knows how to distinguish between the, those who put on a good outward show and those who truly belong to him. Uh, so that ownership, we also see uh, here in Revelation chapter 3, um, it says, to the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. So again, we've got this seal in Revelation chapter 7 is clearly an indication of who belongs to God. And we want to contrast that with the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, which is that mark of loyalty to the beast. So in chapter six, uh, verses 16 and 17, it says, also it, the Antichrist, uh, causes all, both great and small, or small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So remember that we saw in Revelation 3 that this mark is the name of God. In Revelation chapter 14, it's the name of God. It's that indication that these are the ones who belong to God. The mark of the beast, we often get caught up in that number 666. And, and again, this uh, image here is just a, a representation. I'm not indicating that it's going to be a literal brand on the forehead here. Uh, but whatever that mark is, it is about the name of the beast. It's about recognition and ownership by the beast. It is loyalty. I've declared my loyalty to the beast is what the mark is saying. Um, so those who are sealed uh, with the seal of God, and I'm going to try to make that distinction here between the seal and the counterfeit mark, those who are sealed will be delivered. Even though they may go through deep tribulation, even though they may go through deep issues and problems, they will ultimately be delivered. So even though they're not allowed uh, to buy and sell and do all these kind of things during that reign of the Antichrist, they are ultimately going to be delivered. And those who are marked are ultimately going to be destroyed. And we see this in Revelation chapter 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment, this is the ones who received the mark, goes up forever and ever. And they, the ones who have the mark, have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So those who are loyal, who are worshipers of the beast, those who take the mark of the beast, they have one destination, and that is uh, the lake of fire. Um, so those who uh, are sealed or are, are going to be devoted to the Lord. They're going to be faithful so that even though there's all kind of disinformation and delusion and all these kind of things that are going on, remember the, um, the beast is able to perform these incredible signs and wonders. And a lot of people are going to be convinced this is the Messiah. This is Christ. Uh, they're still going to be devoted to him, but those who are marked, uh, those who have the mark of the beast will be deluded. Look at chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. This is part of the uh, repercussions, the consequences of taking the mark, is that people who are loyal to the beast are 
are, are just brainwashed. They are deluded uh, to reality, to truth, and they truly believe that what they're seeing is the real deal. And no matter what the lies are that are being told, they just swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And that's part of the consequence, part of that, that, that judgment of God coming on them that he just gives them fully over to them. Um, now, notice that... Um, the seal does provide protection from God's coming judgment on unbelievers. Look at chapter 9, verse 4. So this is when the trumpets are being blown and you see these plagues and judgments that are coming on the earth. There is a distinction between the people of God and those who belong to the beast. Uh, that It's very much like Egypt. That during the time of Egypt uh, and the plagues were, were being poured out, there was a distinction that was made between the people of Israel and the Egyptians. That when darkness came on the land, that came on the Egyptians, but it did not come on the, uh, the people where they were in the land of Goshen. Uh, so there's a distinction that's made uh, between those who have the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Look at chapter 9, verse 4. They were told not to harm the grass or the uh, of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So the unsealed uh, will receive this judgment, uh, implying that those who have the seal will not. They are not the objects of this. Um and uh, so uh, verse uh, chapter 16, verse two, so the angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped this image. Kind of the implication here is that the target and only those who get these painful sores are those who have the mark of the beast, not those who have the seal of God. Um, now, just a note, uh, the seal does not protect from tribulation. Uh, of men or of the Antichrist. Now, in a previous video uh, on talking about the fifth seal, we talked very clearly uh, that believers will go through tribulation, uh, but tribulation is defined by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 as the world tribulating the saints, not God tribulating, not God bringing this about, but this is the, uh, the, the people who are loyal to the Antichrist are the ones who are bringing about this pain on believers. Uh, so note that very uh, clearly in Matthew chapter 24. So in chapter 13, verse 7, this is what it says uh, that the Antichrist is able to do to believers, those who have the seal of God. And if the Antichrist was allowed to make war on the saints, the people of God, and to conquer them, and authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So it's the, the seal does not make you immune from pain in the world that's coming from the world, meaning the, uh, the, the world system that is opposed to God. Second, it does not protect from physical death. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. So these are people uh, who have uh, been killed during tribulation. Notice mark of the beast happens during that time of great tribulation. And these are specifically identified as believers, followers of Jesus who have not received that mark. And they have been beheaded as a result of that. They've been killed. You don't live very well without your head. Some people try, uh, but uh, in a literal sense, you cannot. Uh, third, we see that the seal represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14 really kind of gives us this understanding of what the seal is. And this is significant because this is for us in the here and now. In him, you, uh, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, in Jesus, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is our seal. And I, I don't know how this all corresponds with a unique event, but I think that this sealing really is uh, the Holy Spirit. And that's a huge and significant thing because it guarantees our uh, our, our promised inheritance, our salvation, it, it guards us against that loss. And that's one of the things that Revelation is trying to convey throughout all this, as we'll see. Um, now, just side note, 
There's no indication that the seal will be physically visible on our foreheads. Mark of the beast, maybe, uh, or it could be some implant under the skin, but it'd be somehow readable. Uh, but it is a spiritual delineator between God's true people and those of the beast. So while the mark of the beast may be visible in some way, if not to the eye, to some kind of electronic reader or whatever is around at that time, uh, the, the seal of God is not necessarily going to be something that people can look at and say, you got the seal of God. We hate you. It'll be more evidenced in our lives, uh, just the difference in the way that we live uh, around them. Uh, and most importantly, God sees it. And that's the key thing. Uh, most people really obsess over the mark of the beast. We would be wise to obsess over whether or not we actually belong to Christ. This is the bottom line. Uh, you can worry and obsess all you want to over the mark of the beast. That That's really a secondary thing. What's far, far more important is, do you belong to Jesus? Is your name in the book of life? And by the way, if you have any questions about that, reach out to me. I'd be glad to communicate with you, converse with you uh, about that very, very critical thing for you. But the big question is, why is this here? So remember, uh, Revelation chapter 6 is the unsealing of the first six of seven seals. And chapter 7 almost seems like uh, this uh, interruption. I mean, so why is it here between the sixth and the seventh seals? Why do we have this interlude? And, and this is commonly the word that you'll find in a lot of commentaries. And there's another uh, couple of places where you're going to see these interludes, like between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, there is an interlude. And so it, it, you need to ask the question, why did Jesus see fit to interrupt John in, in this revealing of the six seals or the seven seals being open? Why do we have this interruption right here? And I think it's because of the, the haunting question from the very last verse of chapter 6. It's about to be answered right here in Revelation 7. That's why this is such an important chapter. That, that last lingering question, after we see all the events of the sixth seal, the, the earthquakes and the terrible things that are happening and the, the kings and everyone else that uh, is, is hiding in the caves and calling out to the rocks following them. And their, their cry is, for the great day of their wrath has come. The lamb and the wrath of God, it's come. And who can stand? There's this understanding from the rich and the powerful and the poor and insignificant alike. God's wrath has come. And nobody can stand against it, can they? And, and that's really the question that we are left with. Is anyone able to be left standing when God decimates the world? And this is kind of just the beginning of it that they're, they're seeing here. Will anyone be left alive? Will anyone survive this? And that's the question that we're left with in chapter 6. And that's what chapter 7 is answering. So that brings us to the big, big question, who are the 144,000? And before we go on, uh, let me just ask you, if you don't mind, uh, again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you're finding anything helpful or insightful in this, uh, go ahead and drop us a like. And if you've never subscribed, uh, I, I would encourage you to do that if you like and want to get more of our content and see what else we have going on and catch it when it comes out. And again, leave those comments of who you think the 144,000 are. Let me know where I'm wrong. It's okay. I can take it. Um, so let's get back to the really, really big question that just really gets tossed around a whole lot. Of who are these 144,000? And again, we first meet them in verse four. It says, then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. So there's two really, really big interpretive questions right off the bat. And this is why there's a lot of discussion on that. And the first is the number itself. Uh, is 140,000 to be understood as a precise actual count, or is it intended to be a symbolic figure? And the second is the people. <laughs> uh, are the tribes of Israel, all the tribes of Israel, as verse 4 says, intended to uh, be literally Jewish descendants or a symbolic representation of all of God's people, Jewish and Gentile believers alike? So uh, there are really four uh, main theories. There are a lot of different ones out there, but here are the four main categories that this falls into. So one is the literal, literal view. So one is the uh, precisely 144,000 and it's Jewish people or Jewish believers. There's a, you know subcategories on that. Second 
is the literal figurative. So this is the 144,000, but it doesn't mean Jewish people. It means super duper Christians. And this is predominantly the Jehovah's Witness view that there's only going to be 144,000 that are sealed. And probably the super duper Christians have already been sealed and you have no hope of even being one of the 144,000. The next one is a symbolic uh, on the number literal on the people. So this means a vast, complete multitude of Jewish people or all Israel. Um, and so that can be just the genetically Jewish or Jewish believers. Uh, and again, it can fall into those two camps there. And then this is symbolic, symbolic. So the number is symbolic and the people are symbolic. And so this is a vast, complete number of all believers. So 144,000 is 12 times 12. Um, and this is significant. The number 12 is usually the complete number of people in uh, Scripture, particularly in the book of Revelation. A thousand is one of those numbers that can be used in a little sense of a thousand, but oftentimes in the book of Revelation, it's intended to convey an uncountable multitude. Um, it's almost the way that we would say a bajillion or something like that today. It's just meant to be this hyperbolic number. We we easily think of a thousand today, but in ancient times, a thousand was a really, really huge number. Uh, and and so uh, for them, they could literally, they, literally, <laughs> they could say uh, a thousand, but symbolically mean uh, as something as an uncountable number. And that's part of the difficulty uh, is, is this really meaning 12 tribes of Israel, or is it just meaning um, the, the complete number of the people of God, 12 time, times 12, that's 144 times 1,000, the uncountable number, and that's uh, the multitude of them. Uh, so bottom line, before we go on, this is not a core doctrinal issue. Uh, we can disagree on this and still be friends. We can still be brothers and sisters in Christ. This is not Iwo Jima. This is not where you plant your flag in the hill and die on it. So, um, you know, we, we might have what we are very, very convinced of is this is it. Uh, but in the end, uh, we'll only find out in the end if we're right or not. And so this is a great point uh, for discussion and, and, and batting around. Uh, but after that discussion, we we better, better, <laughs> in the eyes of Jesus, still be friends at the end. Now, saying that, it's not to say that this is not an unimportant issue. There are some significant theological aspects that come out of this, how you view uh, different things. And so this is why it's still an important issue and why we're taking the time uh, to spend on this in a deep dive on this subject. So again, it goes back to the, the number. Numbers are used in both literal and symbolic ways in the book of Revelation. Uh, in a literal way, we see four angels. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. And here we have maybe a sense of both literal four angels and symbolic in the same verse, four corners of the earth. The earth literally does not have four corners. This is just a symbolic way of saying the totality of earth. And that's okay. And this is where we see the number four indicating a sense of totality in space. Um, and another symbolic use of the number is Jesus is described as having seven eyes and having seven horns. Does Jesus literally have horns? Um, does he literally have seven eyes? No. Uh, he has a resurrected human body, which means two eyes, two ears, one nose, one mouth. Uh, this has not changed. And so the seven is intended to communicate the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-wise aspect of Jesus. And the seven horns is intended to represent the all-power, the all-authority of Jesus. And so again, in chapter five, verse six, you hear this description. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes. So some people want to say, we should just take the, the book of Revelation literally. Well, if that's the case, then Jesus is literally a sheep and he literally has seven eyes and he literally has seven horns. We need to be consistent and, and we need to be using some wisdom to try to discern where scripture is being literal and where it's being symbolic. And sometimes, admittedly, that's difficult. And that's what leads to some of the conversations that we have. So let's talk about the people. Here is the literal view of uh, the people, the group called Israel. Uh, and it says that uh, verse four again, and I heard the number of the sealed 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Uh, so sons of Israel, that kind of sounds like that's literally Israel. And uh, there's 12 tribes that are listed, just like we know that there are, are 12 tribes. So here you can see 
um, the 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 uh, Jacob who is renamed Israel, the the four women uh, that gave birth to the sons, Leah and Rachel are the wives, Zilpah and Bilhah are the concubines. And so the children coming from Zilpah and Bilhah are considered lesser uh, children in the eyes of the ancient Near East because they're coming from concubines, not from wives. And here you have the list in uh, birth order. We'll look a little more closely at this. Um, and then there's the symbolic view that says, um, it looks at that list in Revelation chapter 7 and says, it's a little different. And in fact, it's unique in all of the list of the 12 tribes. There is no other list like this one throughout the entire Bible. Now, none of the uh, lists are, are always used the same way. There are several different varieties of the list, admittedly, in the Old Testament this was an entirely unique one. Uh, it's unique in both the order of uh, the, the tribes as they're listed and the names that are included. And I think both of these are worthy of consideration. So you see the, the two sets of lists here. On the left-hand side is the every tribe list uh, in Revelation 7, the chapter we're looking at. On the right-hand side is the birth order of the sons of Jacob, also called Israel. So let's see if we can do a little comparison here between the two, because you'll see pretty quickly, there are some big differences. Um, number one is that Judah, who was the fourth born, is listed first. Reuben, who is the firstborn, is listed second. And then we have these three, Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. These are not uh, the next born in chronological order. These are actually uh, three sons of uh, the concubines. And then we have Dan, wait a minute. Uh, Dan is entirely missing. Notice he is not at all listed in the every tribe list in Revelation 7. Uh, and then we have Manasseh. Uh, notice he's not in the sons of Jacob list. He's actually a grandson of Israel. Uh, he is the son of Joseph. And then we have Joseph down here. Uh, Joseph is the direct descendant of uh, Israel. Uh, but normally, when you have a list, if Joseph is in there, Manasseh and Ephraim are not. And notice Ephraim is missing. Usually, Joseph is not in the list, and Manasseh and Ephraim are. And this is more about tribal allotments of land. But if it's talking about the actual children of Jacob, then you'll see Joseph listed, but not Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim are the sons of Joseph. Uh, but remember, uh, Jacob blessed uh, th those sons, and they got to take uh, an extra uh, portion of the inheritance in uh, Joseph's place. So rather than Joseph getting one allotment of land, that land is split so that there's actually more land that's being given to Joseph's line. One goes to Manasseh, one to Ephraim. Ephraim's not mentioned in this list, even though Manasseh is, and Joseph is not. So here's what we're seeing. This list has a very clear theological objective. Um, number one, Judah is elevated to first place because the Messiah comes through the line of Judah. So Judah was not a great guy. Uh, so he's not elevated to first because he is so good. Reuben was the firstborn. Now, he screwed up, admittedly, uh, and, and kind of lost his rank and position. But God had chosen the fourthborn, kind of one of these unusual choices that God frequently makes throughout Scripture, the unexpected people. Uh, but the Messiah has clearly come through there. And I think that's why he gets moved to first place in this list. Reuben is the firstborn, but he is not the most significant. So he gets moved to second place. Notice that Gad, Asher, and Naphtali, they're the next ones that are mentioned. And these are the outsiders. These are the ones that are born to the concubines, not the wives. And I think there's something very significant about that. And remember, Manasseh, he's half Gentile. His mama was Egyptian. Part of the reward to Joseph for him saving Egypt from the seven years of uh, famine was that Pharaoh gave him the, the, the daughter of a priest, uh, an Egyptian priest, an Egyptian daughter to be his wife, Manasseh and Ephraim were half Gentile. They were not fully blooded uh, Jewish people. And here he is the next in the line over the full born sons like Simeon, Levi, Levi, significant role, the priest and high priest come through Levi and Benjamin and Joseph. All, he has precedence over them. Uh, Dan, why isn't he mentioned at all? Um, well, could be the idolatry. Judges 18, 18 speaks of the idolatry of, of Dan. 
And there's this old, early uh, second century uh, tradition that we hear about uh, through some of the, the church fathers that actually goes back further. It goes back into the time of, of Jewish tradition uh, that they believe that this anti-Messiah figure would come from the, the tribe of, of Dan, uh, that that little horn uh, kind of element might be coming from um, the tribe of Dan. So he's not listed because he's associated with idolatry, unfaithfulness to God. And so Ephraim is also joined to idols, leave him alone. So why isn't Ephraim there? Hosea 4, 17 may also relate it to this idea of idolatry. So this list is beginning to kind of show us that who God considers to be his sealed is, are those who are loyal to him, who don't have one foot in the camp of God and one foot over in the, in the camp of the world in idolatry. This has been one of the consistent themes throughout the book of Revelation. And I think this is significant and why we don't see that and why this may not actually be a literal listing of the tribes of Judah and therefore little Israel. So the list has a theological uh, objective, and that is God's people includes the out outcast who follow the Messiah with a pure faith. And so this is the outcast, the undesirable, the not people who become his people, and it's the not purely Jewish people like Manasseh. Uh, so that's that's an incredible thing that I think is subtly being messaged through even the, the list order. And, and if you've read that list, you see that 12,000 are appointed from each one. So another interesting aspect of this is that this would be the only place in Revelation where servants of God are by ethnicity only and not by faith. So if this is a literal list of, of, of Israel, this would be a very, very unique thing because they're called the servants of God. The 12,000 from each tribe, these are the servants. And this would be highly unusual. And it would be the only place in the book of Revelation where we find this word servant of God um, only used by ethnicity and not um, uh, by the way it's used in the rest of the book, Jew or Gentile alike. So the Israel language uh, that we see uh, in the New Testament is often used to describe Christ followers also. Um, so Ephesians chapter three, verse six, and you, you really need to read from about the middle of Ephesians chapter two through Ephesians uh, three, six to get the sense of what's being said here. But just to cap encapsulate this, the mystery is that, and so this mystery that he's been talking about, um, this, this thing that has before not been known, but has now been made, to cl uh, made clear because of what Jesus has done on the cross and this mystery, this thing that God has had hidden for all these years, is that Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promises. The promises to Israel are the same ones that Gentile followers of Christ get to enjoy. And so they are partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, so the ones who belong genetically to Israel, the way that they come to that full enjoyment of, of all that Christ has to offer is through the gospel. And the way that Gentiles are now able to enjoy that is through that same gospel. They don't become two distinct groups. They become one new man, one new body, as Ephesians chapter 2 talks about. Uh, don't want to belabor that too much, but uh, let's move on. Galatians 3.29, um, Paul says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So he's speaking to Gentile believers, and he's telling them, you belong to Abraham, that you belong to those same promises, you belong to that same people, Israel. This is a significant thing. We'll, we'll probably do another uh, episode just on this topic, because it is very, very huge in our understanding of what eschatology and the book of Revelation are talking about. Um, there's one other element here within this chapter, uh, and it's a pattern that we see in Revelation in at least a couple of places, and that is the John hears and then John sees. So John hears one thing, but he's going to turn and he'll see something different that is the fuller explanation of what he's hearing. So the, the hearing part gives him a partial understanding the seeing part gives him the fullness of the understanding. So here's the first example is in Revelation chapter 5, 5 and 6. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So John hears 
look, there, there is the, tri the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So what John would have anticipated and what we anticipate from the reading, and this is where that, that little twist in the, the plot comes in, is that when John turns, he's going to see a lion. He's going to see the strong, fierce, messianic figure. But instead, verse 6 says, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So John's in, or anticipating seeing a lion. Instead, he sees not a fierce, fearsome lion. He sees a slain lamb, something that is absolutely helpless and hopeless. But this is that fuller picture of the Messiah. He is not just the conquering uh, Messiah, but he is the one who conquered by his death. He is the one who came as the humble servant, that he is the one who gave his life. He was sacrificial. He is loving. And so that fuller picture of the Messiah is coming from not just what he hears, but in also what he sees. Notice in chapter 7, verses 4 and 12, we have the same pattern happening. And he says, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So what he's hearing is the number. And then we had the listing of the tribes and the numbers. But then notice verse 12. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation. <laughs> so he hears, and if he's turning to look, based on that list, he might expect to see exactly 144,000 Jewish people standing there. And this is the view that many people take. But I think it follows that same pattern in Revelation 5, where there's the anticipation of one thing, but the seeing of the fuller. And the fuller is, it's a great multitude, not just 144,000. And it's from every nation, not just the Jewish nation. And so what I am thinking is that the 144,000 is the symbolic number and the symbolic people, that this is all God's people from all time who are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So the answer to uh, chapter 6, verse 17 is chapter 7, verse 9. Who can stand uh, uh, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Notice this key word. It's going to happen again here in chapter 7, verse 9. After this and look and be behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the land. So who can withstand God's wrath? Who can come out the other side and still be standing? Only those who've been rescued from the wrath. Only those who've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Only they and all of them will stand. Not just those from genetic Israel, not just genetically Jewish, but everyone from every tribe, every nation, every people, every language, who has been sealed by God because they have turned to God, turned to Christ and what Christ has done for us through the magnificent gospel. This is the incredibly encouraging news. So as we see the seals being unleashed and the terrible things that are happening, even though there are going to be people still on earth during all these horrible things that are coming, here's the encouraging note at the very beginning to, and the, the, the hope to be able to stand firm that through all of this, you will still be able to stand, that this will not overtake you, that even though the world comes with everything against you, you will still stand in the end. So only those who are sealed by the Lamb can stand. And only those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb can stand. And only those who follow the Lamb can stand. Revelation 6, 15 and 17, then the kings of the earth, the great ones, and the generals and the rich and the powerful, everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and of the mountains calling to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide from us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. We saw in our episode on this, the last one on the sixth and the seventh seals, that this is seven categories of people. Five of them are the rich and powerful 
And what we saw in that is that their wealth, their power, and their position cannot save them when the wrath of the Lamb comes. And it doesn't matter how much power, how much influence that they might have, that all of that will be meaningless and purposeless whenever the wrath of the Lamb comes. And this question, who can stand? That means that he can't stand. That means that she can't stand. And that means that he can't stand. That only those who are in in Christ can stand. And this is not a political statement. It is a spiritual statement that if any of these are not in Christ, their position and their power cannot enable them to stand. So this is not about the, the politicians. This could be any world leader. This could be Bill Gates. This could be Elon Musk. This could be George Soros. This could be uh, Klaus Schwab. It doesn't matter how wealthy the person is. It doesn't matter who they are. And it doesn't matter if it's the person that you look at in the mirror every morning. If you're not in Christ, you will not stand. You cannot stand. But if you're in Christ, here's the great hope. You will be able to stand. Ha, that's great news. Christ is the answer. And now is that time to be able to turn to him. And again, if you don't know where you stand, if you don't know for sure, if you would be part of the seal of God, reach out to me. Love to talk to you more about that. And that is the, the, the key question in all of this. Do you belong to the lamb? Do you know that for sure? So all of those who are sealed by the lamb will stand and what we see is that every one of us. So here's the security of the seal. And we'll try to go through kind of quickly here, the latter part of chapter seven. The, the sealed then are a vast, seemingly uncountable number from every background, Jewish and Gentile. They are Christ followers clothed in white. This is part of the imagery that comes out in chapter seven. The 144,000 are shown to be clothed in white. Um, and your righteousness, what's being conveyed in this being uh, clothed in Christ is your righteousness is secure in Christ because it's not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of Jesus. And that's what gets applied to us. My favorite verse in scripture is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God in him. If you don't know this, Here's the coolest thing that happens. When a person comes to a place in their life where they realize that they're a sinner, that they need a savior, and that savior is Jesus, that their sin deserves death and hell, but God has sent Jesus to take your place on the cross to pay for your sin, to pay for your guilt, to cover your shame. That the moment that you turn away from your sin and you put your faith in him, in that instant, here's the unfair transaction that takes place. God takes all of your sin as soon as you do this, and he places all of it on Christ, and Christ bears the penalty and the guilt in your place. He is your substitute. At the same time, here's the other side of this that we often overlooked, is that so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God takes all of the righteousness of Jesus and places it on us, so that from that moment on, he no longer looks at us through the lens of our sin. He looks at us through the lens of the righteousness of Jesus. And none of us deserves that. And that's incredibly good news. And your righteousness is secure in Christ. And again, the righteous because of the blood of the lamb, not their own blood. No one is made righteous because of their suffering. No one is made righteous because they've been persecuted. No one is made righteous because they died for Christ. They are Righteous because of the blood of the Christ, the blood of Christ, and the blood of Christ only. Period. Uh, chapter seven, verse fourteen. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They are triumphant because they trusted in the Lamb. Verse ten. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Humans are now initiating the worship. So in chapters four and five, we see the four living creatures initiate worship. We see the 24 elders initiate worship. We see the angels initiate worship. And for the first time in heaven, we see humans initiate worship. And this is cool. And crying out with a loud voice. Uh, this is uh, the, the people. Salvation belonged to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The humans started and all of heaven joins in because this is the great news that salvation is 
from God. It is through Christ. And he has brought that to undeserving humanity. And he holds us fast through everything, even death. So your place in heaven, if you're in Christ, it is secure in Christ. It is Jesus who saves you. It is Jesus who keeps you safe, even in the midst of death. And notice that among all of these who have died for Christ, uh, because there's this picture of those who have died, the martyrs um, that, that are here, not a single martyr is bitter. None of them are disillusioned. None of them are despondent about dying for Christ. They're like, oh, none of them are saying, oh man, why'd you do that to me? Oh, poor pitiful me. Instead, there's just joyous worship that is going on. Their whole perspective has been changed now that they come face to face with who God is. All of them are celebrating salvation, even if it was a painful road to get to the final conclusion of their salvation. And the other picture that we see is that they are safe and that they're shepherded well. The world has abused them. The world leaders have abused them. And it says that he who sits on the throne will shelter them. Safety in his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. Here's some indications of the mistreatment. Uh, that they were homeless, uh, that they were uh, without any shelter from the sun and the elements, um, that they were hungering, they weren't able to buy, they weren't able to sell, uh, and so they were hungry, um, thirsty, trying to find just the basic necessities of life. And yet now in the presence, that ain't happening anymore. By the way, if you come from a background or you've been uh, taught that Christians were never, ever meant to suffer in this world, that this is somehow lack of faith, nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, we are not promised um, a life of security and safety here on planet Earth. And we are not promised to be taken away from threats and dangers and so forth in this life. Uh, we need to be ready. And that's part of the call of uh, Revelation is to endure and engage the world with the gospel until the end. So it says that they came out of the great tribulation, but the affliction of the tribulation do not follow them. Instead, they find comfort in Christ. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is temporary, folks. God, glory is eternal. God is eternal and our, our, our ability to live in his presence and in that glory is eternal. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Part of the hope that we look forward to, that it may go through pain and death even to get to that point in martyrdom, is that we have glory to look for. And the, the, the momentary nature of what we have is nothing. Luke 24, 16 and 17, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. Here's the cool thing. Uh, some of you, they will put to death. That's that's not the cool thing. <laughs> that's a painful thing. Uh, but there is something more that not a hair of your head will perish. Here's what's being communicated. Death is momentary. It's temporary. And it's harmless for the believer. They can kill you, but they can't harm you. That's what's being conveyed by Jesus. Is it, Death is a very temporary kind of thing. Eternity? Well, by very definition, it's forever. Your life is secure in Christ. Your eternal existence is secure. They can kill your temporary life here on planet Earth, but they cannot kill you. They cannot destroy you. And this is where that glorious uh, shout of victory in Romans 8 is so appropriate. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Hmm. Shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. <laughs> for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, there are things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's a great hallelujah. So we've done a deep dive. We've done a lot. Uh, and, and, and I thank you. If you've made it this far, kudos to you. Uh, may there be an extra uh, crown in heaven for uh, enduring me for all this. So we've come to the end. 
um, has your mind been changed? So if you don't mind, uh, drop another comment and uh, just put on there at the end, I think the 144,000 are whoever. If it's the same, let me know. Uh, if it didn't change, it just kind of affirmed what you already believe, or you came in with a, a different conclusion than what I have, uh, and it's different. That's okay. Again, this is not um, Iwo Jima. <laughs> this is not where we plant our flag and die, and we can still be friends. I'm just kind of curious, and I would love to hear from you. And again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, it means so much to me, and uh, my, my great desire is that people come to know Christ more, and that they are prepared for whatever that comes ahead according to the Word of God. Uh, so if you've not yet subscribed, I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll watch some of the other ones. Like the video. That really helps. If you found it helpful, it helps YouTube to know that this is something good for people to see. And that's the only way that it will get out. And that just means a lot to me. It's the greatest compliment. Uh, so yeah, if you've got questions or comments or uh, want to tell me where I'm wrong, that's okay. Uh, again, just thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. God bless.